Welcome to the European Central Bank podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Michael Steen, and in this episode, we are marking the first two decades of Europe's single currency, the Euro. It's been two decades with two very different stories. The first saw the peak of a nearly 30 year upswing in the global financial cycle, and the second 10 years saw the worst economic and financial crisis since the Great Depression in the 1930s. Let's first go back to the very early days of the Euro with this audio clip. On the 1st of January, at zero hour, the introduction of Euro banknotes and coin marked not only the completion of economic and monetary union, which is a crucial achievement in itself, but one of the major, if not the major, step forward in the history of European integration. I am convinced that the 1st of January 2002 will appear in the history books in all our countries and beyond as the start of a new era in Europe. That was Wim Dersenberg, the first ECB president, speaking in 2002. The euro was launched as a currency on the 1st of January 1999, but initially it existed on bank statements uh, and electronically. In 2002, when Mr. Dersenberg was speaking in our clip, was the year that the euro banknotes and coins actually entered into circulation. So what was it like back then? My first guest today is Erki Likonen. When he joined the Finnish parliament, he was the youngest MP at the time. Subsequently, he served as Finnish finance minister. He was also European commissioner, and he served as ECB governing council member as the governor of the Bank of Finland. So with all of that experience, he has an insider's perspective on the development of the single currency, the relative calm that we spoke of in the first decade, and then the turbulence of the second. Erki, welcome and thanks for joining us on the podcast. Thank you. Um, now, Finland was one of the group of the first countries that adopted the euro as their currency in 1999. At the time, you were European Commissioner for Budget. What was the atmosphere like back then and what did this moment mean for Europe and what did it mean for Finland? For Finland, uh, the joining the EU meant that Finland gets a seat around the table where the decisions are taken. Normally the history of Finland had been decided uh, uh, above the heads of the Finnish people. Now we became part of the European institutions. Finland you wanted to be at the core everywhere, including economic and monetary union. So the decision was taken to be able to guarantee that we have we have an influence everywhere. At the time, the debate in Finland about joining was it was it a difficult one or an easy one? There was discussion. There was also paper done by the academics, which said, of course, that we we, we can join, but we must have flexibility in the economy. We must have buffers so we can adjust ourselves because you can't use exchange rates. But it was not very difficult. Of course, later when the crisis came. Discussion re-emerged, but now again it's pretty stable. So, so support for euro is very high in Finland. Now, as as we discussed or we mentioned just now, the the first ten years of the euro were were fairly calm, and periods of low inflation. Then, in two thousand seven, two thousand eight, um, we had what we call the great financial crisis hitting. It started as a financial crisis affecting banks, and later developed into a, a full blown sovereign debt crisis, in which markets even began to speculate about the breakup of the euro. Um, Talk us through that. What, what were the key moments for you? 2007 summer was, of course, the uh, first uh, important moment because then the turbulences in the market started, the liquidity evaporated, some banks were closing their, their investment funds. And I must say that then uh, Jacques Le who was then VCB president, had the instincts right. He, he felt it can be big, important. Uh, a little later, Fed also followed. They gave liquidity to banks because they saw the difficulty. And England uh, didn't consider the situation so serious. That was like the first, first uh, la première. Then the second big phase was, of course, then in September 2008. We had the informal ECOFIN where the ministers of finance and governors uh, took part in Nice, France. It was, by the way, chaired by French finance minister Christine Lagarde. We had a great dinner on Friday evening, when May came back at night, Jacques Richer, then president of ECB, said, we need a meeting. It was over the midnight. And that what is the reason there's a problem in the United States with the Lehman Brothers? And we asked, is it serious? 
and he gave uh, words which showed that it's very serious. And that was last, let's say, that the weekend where it all started. Monday, Labour Brothers went under. The markets uh, reacted uh, very strongly, and we didn't know when we get it back, come again. But that weekend is something that we, we never forget. I can imagine. And w at the time, though, you, so there was a problem with a, a, a very significant bank in, in the United States. What, what were your fears about how it would affect the euro area? We didn't know then, because even in America, people thought that it's only one bank, and Lehman Brothers was not a huge bank. Uh, they thought that it's, it's you know, contained, risks are well con under control. But when the confidence disappears, the change can be very fast, and it surprised all. At the time also, it was not a European bank. Perhaps people thought that it doesn't hit us so early. Of course, history tells another story. There's the quote by uh, Mario Draghi speaking in London in, in 2012. And as you already said, that, that was a, a key moment in the crisis. And you have these three words, whatever it takes. But can you explain a bit why, why that helped turn, the, turn around the situation? That there was this moment where people were openly speculating about some countries possibly leaving the Eurozone. How did that you, phrase uh, help? The phrase helped, but also actions taken. Of course, it was uh, uh, Mario Draghi's communication was uh, re remarkably clear. But equally important was that during the following governing council meetings, decisions were taken, what it means, ah. what kind of actions ECB is ready to take. So you need those two together. We now fast forward to today, and banks are now supervised by the ECB mm -hmm. as part of the single supervisory mechanism, as part of this banking union, which isn't quite complete yet, mm -hmm. but is still being built. That said, it doesn't feel like the world is that certain. I mean, we have trade wars, tariffs, Brexit. How, how do you see it today and how, how strong do you think the euro area is today to withstand shocks? Of course, this, these trade wars are, have a very negative impact on the world growth. If there's something where economists agree, it is that free trade is critical for, for growth in the long term. We know now that there are also downsides. The, that not all have been, have been winning with those. We have not perhaps paid enough attention to these areas where jobs have been lost. But anyhow, all in all, free trade is critical. So that's one issue. What about your area? Yes, central bank is, is stronger. We have been able to create uh, monetary policy. And monetary policy tools have been acting. But of course, when rates are very low, the capacity to move below earlier ones is more limited. What we need to do now are two things. One is that we need to create a complete banking union, make capital market union, which means that the risks in your area would be shared by private investors. If capital markets are free, they function cross border, the risks are shared also by investors. You don't need taxpayers there. And there we must go deep and, and be, be very firm there. Second issue, of course, is that, that we need also more more input from the fiscal policies. In those countries where there is margin, or there, there are possibilities, of course, fiscal policies should also be used. So, so the, all these three elements, monetary policy, deep financial market union, and active role for fiscal policy are needed in the future. Now, can I ask you also to benefit from your long experience uh, in European affairs, if you take your crystal ball and you say, well, we've had 20 years of the euro now, and you try and look ahead to the next 20 years. What's your sense? Where, where will the euro be in another 20 years? If you asked me 20 years ago what will happen during the next 20 years, I would not have been able to guess. And I don't know where the world will take us, but I have, I have a lot of confidence on the decision makers in the future. They will analyze the incoming information, take the, the decisions which are necessary within the mandate of the ECP. But we can't possibly see where the next crisis comes. Normally, it doesn't come from the direction you expect. So just be ready ready for, for anything and be prepared. Erki, thank you very much for sharing your insights with us. Thank you. In contrast to Erki's first-hand account, our next guest can offer a slightly different perspective on the Euro's development over the last 20 years, that of an observer from the outside looking in. Martin Wolf is chief economics commentator at the Financial Times, a position he has held since 1996, 
though he's been looking at economics issues for considerably longer than that. I had a chat with him recently during our annual research conference where he was chairing a panel on 20 years of the euro. Here's how the conversation went. Martin, you, you wrote earlier this year a column um, about the anniversary and you said that it had been the currency had been through a traumatic adolescence, um, but in the end you concluded it's doomed to succeed. Can you just recap a little bit your thoughts? Very briefly, I regarded this as a very risky project from the beginning, producing a single currency among what are in other respects above all fiscally still sovereign states, very different economies was a gamble, it's obvious. In the first decade, from 1999 to 2009, it looked as though it was going very well. Risk spreads on debt reduced, inflation converged, growth was very strong in the periphery, it looked basically fine. But then in the following 10 years, after the global financial crisis then morphed into a Eurozone crisis, it turned out that a lot of that was sort of built on sand. There have been huge mistakes made in important countries with private sector lending. It wasn't fiscally driven. There were severe competitiveness problems that had emerged. And this morphed into a sovereign debt crisis from the financial crisis, a banking crisis as, uh, as well. And that, of course, inevitably became a political crisis. Nonetheless, with immense effort and difficulty, important reforms were made creation of the European Stability Mechanism, the whatever-it-takes position of the ECB, quantitative easing, and of course uh, an integrated supervision mechanism, a way of dealing with banks, further ideas of reform. So it did get through it, but, which is the last point, it's not going to be easy. There's still lots of problems, and of course it is doomed to succeed because if it fails, I think the whole European project is in question. Although one of the strengths of the crisis that you've talked about, of course, is that um, the political will that exists. And you, you told a nice story about um, being in the States in 2012, talking to hedge fund managers who are betting that the whole thing was going to go fall apart. Yes. A number of my columns in which I wrote, and I can think of one in particular, which I wrote that uh, people uh, underestimated the commitment to this it was a response to exactly that, uh, a dinner I had with some very, very senior Wall Street people in which basically the consensus was this couldn't possibly survive. It was just this was never a very good idea and the politics would tear it apart. And I argued on the contrary that first of all, it's very costly to leave, that's absolutely clear, and secondly, that you should never underestimate the commitment of the really powerful nations, above all Germany, to keep this going. So they would do enough always to ensure that it was kept going. That's what I argued then. I think I will be inclined to think that's still true. Therefore, I do believe it's likely to survive. But it won't be optimal or, or close to it. The problem is, yes, it might survive, but at the same time corroding progressively the commitment of the peoples of Europe to this. And then at some point, you never know when it might actually fall to pieces. Un unless? The, I mean, unless, the, now, this is, this is very, very difficult. There are essentially um, two linked uh, uh, problems. They have to fix, um, either fix the aggregate demand problem in a big way, which means, I think, giving themselves real capacity to use fiscal policy. Uh, and um, adjustment mechanisms that really work, which means actually, let's be quite clear, if you're going to have 2% inflation in the Eurozone, that means some countries should have three or four. Which countries should have three or four? Well, obviously the countries where domestic demand is deficient. Where is domestic demand most deficient? Germany and the Netherlands. It's massively below potential output, and this is no longer easily supportable in the world. So their demand has to grow. This is sort of self-evident. This is part of the adjustment mechanism and the aggregate demand problem. And then the other thing you have to do, I think, is no doubt if you don't do that, to the extent you don't do that, there will have to be some form of fiscal transfer and mutual insurance. Um, countries cannot be left quite as much on their own as they have been. That will, of course, require probably some mechanism for debt restructuring which don't yet fully exist. Um, there has to be a deal on this risk-sharing aspect of the system, in other words. So there's a macro-demand problem, 
a competitiveness problem and a risk-sharing problem, and they have to be solved together. If they can be solved, and there's obviously lots of technical detail here, I think it will survive pretty well. If they aren't resolved, it might survive perfectly well, but I think future very severe crises are certain. That's rather gloomy prognosis. I emphasise that I think it will survive. But, you, but yeah. the question is, will it survive happily and successfully, or will it survive rather miserably and grumpily because people feel they just can't get out of it? I feel we are a bit closer to the latter than is safe. I mean, of course, that's not true everywhere, but there's a lot of unhappiness. It's obvious, and that has to be dealt with. You can't survive indefinitely if you don't make peoples of Europe believe in this is good for them. Christine Lagarde ju just said this, I think, and she's absolutely right. And in a nutshell, then, what, what, is, your, what is your answer then? In that, in, what, what is the big political bargain that you think needs to be struck here? My view, the logic of the euro system in the end is towards a greater degree of, his, of political union. It's part of it. I'm not talking about tomorrow, but over, if I were asked in 2050 if it still exists, what would I expect it to look like? Well, I would expect it to look more like a federation. Okay. And that, I think, is where it will have to end up. How it will get there, I don't know. Will it get there? I don't know. But I think if it doesn't, further really very, very difficult crises are inescapable. Thank you very much, Martin. My next guest is Syria Angino. She works here at the ECB's communications department and is a behavioral economist. As part of her tasks, she studies institutional trust and specifically trust in the ECB. Uh, Syria, thanks a lot for joining us on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Now, we're here celebrating 20 years of the Euro, um, but you're also actually the youngest guest we have on today's podcast. So I, I wanted to ask you a bit about your personal experience of um, the launch of the Euro, probably when the banknotes entered circulation. Can you remember where you were and what happened? Sure, sure. It was during my Christmas holidays. So I was 11. I was spending Christmas holidays with my family in the south of Italy, in this small town where my grandparents used to live. And uh, I remember vividly uh, that on the 1st of January, everyone was rushing to the ATMs, to actually the only ATM in town, to withdraw these banknotes, this crisp banknote, and they were showing to us, to the kids, and we were so happy. Everyone was so enthusiastic. It was like being in a big party. Well, you were old enough to get um, pocket money at the time. Yes. I suppose if you were going from Lira, there was a, in, t in nominal terms, it f did you think, oh, I'm getting less? And <laughs> do you have plans for how to spend the new euros? <laughs> Well, I, uh, I received uh, um, 10,000 lire, so 5 euro more or less, and uh, I planned my first purchase in euro very carefully, of course. Go and tell us what it was. Yes, so I wanted it to be very special, so I bought what was more special for me at that time, so I bought Harry Potter stickers as the first thing. Yes. Wow, very good. Now, uh, let's turn a bit to, to your, your research. Um, I, I mentioned that you, you research uh, trust. Um, can you tell us, first of all, what we actually mean when we talk about trust in institutions and why should a central bank care about public trust? Um, as you can imagine, since we are dealing with an abstract concept, uh, trust in institutions has been defined in many different ways. Now, the definition that I will propose today is um, uh, trust in an institution is the belief that, in our case, a central bank will deliver on its mandate, but also, by doing so, it will take into account ethical considerations. So there are two aspects here to be considered. The first one is the central bank must be competent, must, be, um, must have the expertise in-house to deliver on the mandate. And this is actually what financial markets think as, uh, of, as trust. So they equate, in a sense, trust and credibility. But in our research, we have seen that the public needs more to trust an institution such as a central bank. They also need to know that the central bank is acting in a fair manner, in an ethical way. So this also, there's also a component of values that they take into account when deciding whether to trust or not the central bank. This general public uh, measure of trust is very interesting and brings us on to what actually happened in the crisis. I and mean, we talked a bit about the crisis years with Erki and Martin. What has it done to the ECB in terms of levels of trust and wh where are we now? When we look at institutional trust, we use data from the Eurobarometer survey, which is run by the Commission. Uh, it's been run for the last 20 years, so we have a perfect uh, time window to consider. 
Now, the ECB started with very high levels of trust, but of course the financial crisis disrupted that. Now, it must be noted that trust in the ECB was not the only one that plummeted. Trust in the European Commission, in the European Parliament, followed the same pattern. This pattern also extended to national institutions, to private and public institutions in the US and also in Europe and around the world. So it was really a systemic crisis going on. So, uh, so there's been a, a general trend downwards. Um, is there any sign of this picking up now? Or? Yes, actually in the last three years we see that the recovery is starting. So today, actually according to the last data from the Eurobarometer, uh, trust in ECB is at 43%. Now, you mentioned Eurobarometer data, um, which as you said, has this nice long time series available. They, they've also been measuring all along um, where, how Europeans feel about the Euro and the support for the Euro. Tell us a little bit about where that is and what the trend is, has been there. Well, support for the Euro actually hit the record uh, with the last uh, survey. So 76% of people support the euro. So more than three out of four people. It's interesting to see how the crisis could not dent support for the euro. So while trust in all institutions went down, the support for the euro slightly, of course, declined, but not that much. This is really interesting because, I mean, the 76% is, of course, across the whole euro area, so that's an aggregate number. If you start looking at individual countries, I hear cited very often is Greece, and we hear about, I mean, obviously Greece went through a very difficult adjustment. What actually happened to levels of support for the euro there, and, and where is it now for Greece? So Greece today has a level of support for the euro, which is 70%, so it's pretty high. And even if we look at the lowest uh, support, which is recorded, unfortunately, in my country, Italy, we're still talking about 65% of support. The countries are converging. And instead, if you look at the top three, or top four, even better, you find very diverse countries. You have Slovenia and Estonia, which are recent euro adopters. And then you have Portugal, which was hit by the financial crisis hard. And they're all at the top. Yeah, yeah. all at mm -hmm. the top. And the fourth one is Finland, which is a country with a different uh, say story, in a sense, and different culture. So you really see a diversity there. And the countries are converging in this support for the euro. Well, that's, that's good news. I think one thing that you're also looking at then, we talked a bit about how trust in institutions fell, including the ECB. So if you were to plot, and I know you've done this, a chart of um, uh, trust in the ECB versus support for the euro, you see it. Tell me what that looks like. There's a sort of divergence, isn't there? There's a big discrepancy starting in, uh, with the financial crisis. So before that moment, support for euro and trust in the ECB were very close, but then this gap widened. Uh, now it's closing a little bit, but still we are like 30%. Uh, there is a 30% gap between trust uh, in the ECB and support for the euro. And that's something that literature might suggest we should worry about? Well, I mean, the determinants of support for the euro and trust in the ECB are very different. The euro is not just a currency. The euro is a symbol, is an ideal. Trust in the ECB instead depends much more on economic factor, on something that is valuable. So, of course, humans are fallible, institutions are fallible, but the euro represents an idea. It taps into the European identity uh, of people. So it's really something else. Why should the central bank uh, worry about trust uh, as, a, as something that it measures? There are three main reasons. The first one is linked to the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. So how the actions or the decisions taken by the ECB then translate into the real economy. We have evidence that higher trust in the ECB better anchors the inflation expectations of normal people, like consumers, small medium enterprise owners, to the target of the ECB, so inflation close but below 2% in over the medium term in the euro area. Trust in the ECB better allows the institution to deliver on its mandate. Just to clarify that, you're saying that if the trust is higher, tends to be higher, then it's easier for the central bank to reach its inflation target? Absolutely, because it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If people think and trust the ECB, that it will reach its target, then they will start acting like this is the truth. This will actually change the, how the economy is working. So inflation will al align to the target more easily. Fascinating. The second reason has to do with the 
fact that the central bank is a supranational institution and an independent central bank. Now, we know that an independent central bank made a deliver on the mandate, and uh, this independence is balanced by an accountability framework that we have with the European Parliament. But at the same time, this is not sufficient. We also need the trust of the public, because otherwise, if trust plummets, what happens is that people might pressure their politicians to restrict the space of maneuvering of the ECB. So maybe changing the mandate, eliminating some instruments. So public trust shields uh, the ECB from these political attacks. Or any central bank, right? Any central bank, of course. And the third reason, instead this time it's really connected to the status of the ECB as a European institution. Now, of course, trust in the ECB is going to feed into trust for the European project as a whole. So this is another reason why we should really care about trust in the ECB. Thank you very much, Syria. Thanks. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode. I want to thank Erki Likkanen, Martin Wolf, and Syria Angino for joining the conversation and giving us their insights. Do also look in the show notes for links to related papers and publications from the ECB. And we'd love to hear your feedback and thoughts for future episodes via social media. You can use direct messages and comments. You've been listening to the European Central Bank podcast with Michael Steen. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. Until next time, thanks for listening.